Um, okay, so a couple of words about the second panel. So um, as we already seen from our excellent first panel, um, different people from different disciplines provided excellent perspectives on computational social science. And then for the second round of um, talks, we emphasize um, people who are doing empirical work using big data sets. Okay. So I'll start um, as the first speaker for um, this panel. So I want to start us off with an anecdote. Okay. So exactly 80 years ago, in 1936, the largest public opinion poll in American history was conducted to try to predict what people will vote for, um, FDR on the left or um, Alfred Landon on the right. So uh, 2.4 2 million people were polled, and the results were uh, clear and unambiguous. So Landon on the right is going to win by the landslide. Uh, the rest was history, right? So it turns out FDR carried 46 states with 528 electoral votes, while Landon got only two states with eight electoral votes. Okay. So how did such a large sample um, public opinion poll got so wrong? Well, it turns out um, the big data set was from um, a magazine called the Literary Digest. It surveyed its own subscribers who are skewed towards automobile owners and telephone subscribers. In other words, if we do something like today, if we trust public opinion on a national policy to um, you know, Fox News poll or CNN poll, we will be deadly wrong. Which tells us that a big data set, 2.4 million, which will be a big data set if, uh, even by today's standards, is not necessarily better data set. So a little bit about my own research. Um, I study social dynamics, online behaviors in massively multiplayer online games such as EverQuest, League of Legends, and EVE, and so on. Um, so I want to put things in perspective using a recent study example. So um, there was a lot of uh, gender disparity in the game community. Um, women are vastly outnumbered by men. And there was this long-held stereotype that women make worse gamers. So we really wanted to take a look to see if this stereotype was true. Now, if you just look at um, you know, cross-sectional data, looking at how many women are there, and what level or what other kill statistic they do have, it turns out you know, women are only about 20% of the entire population. And also, um, their statistics, their levels tend to be lower on average. But that... Um, but, the, but that cross-sectional load does not take into account how much time each player invests in developing their characters, doesn't take into account a lot of, um, um, a lot of variables such as character choices that are correlated with gender. So thanks to big data in EverQuest and also in Zhen uh, Xiaqingyuan in Chinese, we looked at um, people's longitudinal um, behaviors in those games, and we arrive at this conclusion that women are actually not worse gamers than men. So being a conscientious research researcher that I am, I try to reach out to the game community by writing an opinion piece, and it debunks one of the biggest stereotypes about women in the gaming community, and as you can imagine, we get very passionate comments from the game community, um, for which I will not repeat, but I will summarize the gist of it. So first of all, well, we were criticized because they said the female gamers we study are not normal people, basically. So they're self-selected, and they also have the survivor bias, so they're better than average. A valid criticism, I have to say. The second criticism is that, well, you look at the wrong game. You know, if you look at so-and-so game, you'll probably find a different result, okay? Um, again, a valid criticism. And the third criticism is that researchers like you, like, like me, are feminist warriors. So they're implying that we are trying to fish for any empirical evidence that fit our a priori conclusion. For the record, that was not true. However, I think this criticism is somewhat valid in that it indicates researchers like us have a great degree, a degrees of freedom in what we do. In other words, if you imagine there are two identical, res uh, there are two research teams, and each had access to your own data, and then they have different research designs. Conceivably, those different research designs may lead them to um, qualitatively different conclusions with the exactly the same data set. So all these um, could be biases um, in big data research, and those biases are opaque. And then it makes this question especially difficult: to whom and what? Do we wish to generalize our findings? And I think this question is not being discussed enough. 
So in the schematic visualization, we always have this theoretical um, and the empirical targeted populations from which we draw a sample, and then we have this uh, final sample. In a perfect world, uh, we should have invariant transformation as we filter it, every step of the way should be unbiased. However, nowadays every step, um, so the first step, the theoretical versus the empirical target populations are often very vague and not discussed enough. The second um, filtering from the population to the sample is often very non-random and arbitrary. We, we just make a decision. I'm going to take the 30 days of Twitter data, for example. But why 30 days? Why this time period? You know, lots of um, unjustified arbitrary decisions. And then the third um, filtering is original sample to the final sample. Again, we have a lot of non-standardized protocol here. In other words, we can basically do whatever we want. We have lots of researcher degrees of freedom, which makes this question especially difficult. Um, so nothing is more illustrative of the importance of biases than this recent example of trade a Twitter bot. Some of you may have heard about it. So this is a conversational AI that gets smarter as it talks to more human beings on Twitter, but it went from humans were super cool to full Nazi in less 24 hours. <laughs> uh, so Microsoft had to take it down. So which tells us that your model is only as good as your training set, right? So your output is only as good as your input. Okay, so that's the lessons learned. Bigger is not necessarily better. Opaque biases and we have to ask ourselves about generalization. Thank you. Thanks, so I'm uh, Josh from UC Berkeley. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the sort of work I and my lab do, but I'm gonna try and make a larger point, um, which is that I think there are certain domains, and, and what I'm gonna talk about is poverty research, where like relatively small innovations can have like pretty outsized impacts. Um, and so I'll talk about just one example um, in the sort of work that I do about how new data and methods can help us understand sort of causal effects in determining poverty. Um, and what I'm gonna talk about is actually just a very simple measurement, sort of boring question, um, but hopefully will illustrate the larger point. Um, and so what, what this data in front of you is showing you is, well, I guess maybe it's worth starting, taking one step back and saying that I think, you know, everyone in this room, we're, we're sort of immersed in big data. And I, I don't just mean that like computer scientists and social scientists and computational social scientists are thinking about how we can use internet and social media to unlock new questions, but you know, we also live in a world where the US government's investing $10 billion every decade to conduct a census, and there's a Bureau of Labor Statistics, and an ACS, and an IRS, and these are regularly conducting and aggregating and disseminating data. Um, but for most of the world, this is like not the case, sort of like this big data uh, narrative is, is really pretty far from the truth, and, and, and so this table can sort of illustrate this. If you look at um, you know, in Afghanistan, where one of the projects I'll talk about um, is being conducted, it's been 35 years since there's been a nationally representative survey. Um, and if you look at the bottom, you can see just how much changes in a country um, in the course of, say, 40 years, right? In Angola, the population swelled, there was a civil war, there was mass migration, there was forced dislocation, and so forth. And so, you know, these, these really sort of poor data points play into not just how social scientists do research, but how important policy decisions are made. And so, you know, my computer science colleagues say, oh, let's, you know, there's, what about all that work that shows how you can use Twitter data to measure unemployment in Spain, or social network data in Portugal to measure population density? Um, yes, but then when you look at sort of the geography of social media, there's these big black holes for most of the places that are having the same official data that gaps. Um, and then, you know, economists say, well, what about all this work that, and political scientists that uses night lights to predict wealth? And you know that regions that look bright from satellites in the night tend to be wealthier. And that's true, and it's really good at sort of distinguishing between wealthy and poor. But if you're thinking about like distinguishing between poor and ultra poor, which is really the decision that policies are making, policymakers are making when they're saying, where do I allocate these scarce resources? You know, it basically looks uniformly dark. Um, and so I think the two exceptions, uh, and Dr. Friens alluded to this a little bit, um, that are relevant to poor populations are phone data and, and satellite data. So now we're in an age where literally every populated area of land on the planet is photographed every day by satellite, and this data is available to researchers. Um, something like 65% of uh, developing country adult populations own and use a mobile phone. 
And so, um, you know, what, what, what we've done and other people have done is show that you can just take this basic data and, you know, calibrate it against some sense of ground truth. Um, and the, the, the ground truth that I tend to work with is, is actual survey face-to-face -face or household survey data. Um, and combine these to get, you know, rough, relatively crude, not better than sort of a nationally representative household survey, but some estimate, sort of like the Band-Aid estimate of where you think, what you think the distribution of wealth and poverty looks like. Um, and when you start to aggregate these estimates, so these estimates were based on mobile phone data. Um, the idea is that you can sort of predict someone's wealth based on how they use their phone, and you know where they're located based on how they use their phone, and then you can build maps based on those predictions, and you can aggregate them to get maps that are um, roughly as accurate as a five-year-old household survey. Um, you know, and uh, again, not as good as a household survey. If you have the money to do a household survey, do it. But this is about 1% of the cost and about 4% of the time to get estimates from mobile phone data. So I think, you know, the, the, the lesson here is that, you know, relatively small improvements. And really all we're doing here is taking algorithms that are designed basically to do real-time ad targeting or like financial market prediction and applying them in a different context. Um, you can really have sort of... Um, in some sense, outsized impacts. That's it. I just want to say Kim Shaman from Sociology, sorry, she was sick today, and so we uh, have a slide to honor her, but, the <laughs> but uh, we will move on. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jana Diesler, and I'm from the University of Illinois. I'm at the high school there. So when we talk about um, computational social science, I think there are some co cool new things we can do, and maybe most of you are actually actively doing them. For one, we now have a chance to listen to people without having to ask them, simply because they generate digital trace data as intended or unintended byproducts of their daily activities. Um, second, sometimes we have access to full population data from a community or from a country or whatever, which puts us in a situation where we can measure things instead of having to statistically estimate them. Um, third, um, as has been pointed out by many others before, oftentimes we not only have access to interaction data, knowing who interacted with whom, how or through what medium, but we also know what was the information or knowledge um, that was flowing through these channels. And we can think about methods and technologies that we build and test that allow us to consider both of these things together and see what their joint interaction actually helps us to learn about theories that we wouldn't know otherwise. Now, this is all things we could do. I'm not saying we should do them. Um, it's possible. The fourth one probably is, is a more normative thing where we now are in a situation um, where collaboration between computational people and social science people allows us to not only take big data, smash them against the wall, look for patterns to emerge, fit some parameters to the patterns, and, and we publish that. No, no, no. We can also explain why we see what we see by accounting for the social phenomena that are underlying these patterns and help us to explain why do we actually see that, what happened, what happened there. So in, in my group, we do these things by bringing together um, social science theories and helping let them help us um, find features for machine learning, um, do natural language processing, doing text mining, and trying to enhance theory in, in both of these camps. And I'll show you some of the lessons we have learned from that. So for one, uh, one of the things we do is looking how do theories that we often use to formulate hypotheses, to, to interpret our results, to find features for analysis, how do those theories um, actually hold up in today's context. Many of the social science theories for used in network analysis were built in the 60s, 70s, or earlier based on long-term observations of small groups. Is that actually still true in terms of behavior for large online data? We don't know. So one thing we do is we use um, natural language processing to enhance graph data with stuff from information that flows through these graphs and help us to, to test some of the theories that are out there. So for example, we use sentiment analysis, uh, domain adapted sentiment analysis to label edges and graphs um, to test structural balance theory, um, finding certain ratios of balance and imbalance in large-scale graphs over time without having to ask people whether they like each other or not by basically inferring that from communication data. Um, 
Another example is triadic closure theory, a very commonly used theory in social network analysis where statistical models have been developed that estimate the upper and lower bound of triadic closure in, for example, citation graphs, collaboration graphs, um, co-authorship graphs to be a two-digit number somewhere between 20 and 40 percent. Now, those are good statistical estimates. What we take in, do in these cases, or in this case, was taking long-term big data from a variety of communities and simply count, like, does closure actually happen? And finding a lower bound of 1 to 3 percent and an upper cut of actual closure happening in co-citation graphs of um, 4 to 7 percent, which is much less, but probably more realistic. Um, we also look at data quality at scale, um, and I agree with bigger isn't necessarily better. What we do is um, looking at the impact of the plethora of tiny little decisions that we all make when we collect data, store data, prepare data, pre-process data, chunk data. Um, what, does, what is the impact of all these processes in the end results? What does that mean for policy making? And if there's a bias, how can we methodologically take that out or reverse engineer that out? Um, so we did this, for example, f um, f uh, with looking for citation graphs, uh, uh, sorry, author name disambiguation in different contexts and looking at what, what does the cultural component of the people in your network actually have to do with that. If you have Asian names, there's a lot more disambiguity in your graphs than when you have um, classic Western European names, for example, which are much more unique, but um, easier to disambiguate and cause much less of a bias in these graphs. Um, all right, um, so, but it's complicated when you work with human-centered data or any sort of online data, there's all these regulations that might be in your way of doing research. It's not only IRBs, there are a lot of other sectoral um, and organizational norms. There's privacy law, there's security laws, there's technical regulations, there's terms of service, and last but not least, there are personal values and ethics that people do bring to the table, whether they are aware of that or not. And then there are all these solutions to, to change of these things. One of the um, open ones is policy making and legislation for online human centered data. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a sociologist. <laughs> um, Criminology was a bit slow to embrace the social network analysis turn in the social sciences, but as with other subfields, criminal network research has exploded in the past decade, but not without some unintended consequences. Criminal network research uses social network analysis to study crime in criminal groups. We study the structure of gangs, terrorist organizations, co-offending, prohibition era Chicago organized crime, mafias, hackers, smugglers, and white collar conspiracies. In criminal networks, we are seeking rather than assuming net, uh, structure, and we use social network analysis to determine the boundary, effect, or organization of criminal groups. In doing so, we are learning just how disorganized some criminal groups actually are, and how central individuals in criminal networks are not always the crime leaders or the bosses known to law enforcement. Data for criminal network research come almost entirely from police records, legal cases, and investigations. So these are data sources that were not intentionally designed for social network analysis purposes. It is the case that criminal networks based on official crime data might more accurately reflect the activities and opinions of criminal justice agencies more so than the actual criminal groups themselves. Considering this data limitation, still come some incredible findings. For example, we have learned how criminal networks organize to maximize concealment at the expense of organizational efficiency. We have learned that network multiplexity was a rare but structurally relevant property of prohibition era organized crime, with relationships beyond criminal to include family, friendships, politics, business, and law. We have learned that social contagion accounts for 63% of gun violence in Chicago as violence spreads like a disease through high-risk offending networks. My job as a sociologist is to study, not solve crime, but criminal justice organizations feel otherwise. And they have begun using social network analysis in violence reduction efforts, problem-oriented policing, focused deterrence, and targeting of key players. Perhaps it is possible that network methods 
CAD could help narrow the focus and reach of the criminal justice system, leading to fewer and fairer contacts with residents of our most vulnerable communities. But criminal justice implications confront criminal network scholars with new questions. Can fringe groups or individuals be identified before the commission of a crime? Can criminal networks predict and target future violence in a way that is ethical and not overly deterministic? Because at the end of the day, we are just repurposing law enforcement data, conducting post hoc analyses to study already discovered criminal groups. And the 9-11 uh, terrorist ne network is one of the famous examples. Last summer, the unintended consequences of criminal networks research became apparent and especially controversial, controversial in Chicago. The Chicago Police Department released its strategic subject list that identified Chicago residents most closely connected to gun violence. The list was informed by a predictive algorithm that included insights from criminal networks research. Chicago police used the list to explain a violent Memorial Day weekend when 64 people were shot and 78% of those individuals were on the list. The list, again, wasn't used for violence intervention, but a post hoc justification. Human rights groups and concerned citizens criticized these types of lists as not being transparent and generating a new form of profiling. During a political moment when distrust of police is high, it is possible to see how criminal networks can generate controversy, especially when the focus of network analysis is to target previous offenders rather than to prioritize saving future potential victims. I still believe that criminal groups are just as worth studying as workplaces, peer groups, and Facebook networks. That's me at Al Capone's grave. <laughs> But I do wonder whether our research tools or our computational methods are neutral or should we be concerned about their reappropriation? As a social scientist, I want to develop these tools and I want to access crime data to better understand groups, processes, relationships, and inequality. If criminal networks, if criminal networks research can help reduce homicides in disadvantaged communities, then I think that's great. However, surveillance of disadvantaged communities and individual consequences of criminal justice system contact have created a huge divide in this country. Can criminal network research continue in ways that are meaningful to communities without increasing harm? Thank you. Um. Yeah, it's great that I'm speaking after Chris because I actually want to speak a lot about unintended consequences too. Um, and because my answer to this question of what have we learned after a decade uh, of computational social science is that we can now crack the problem of unintended consequences. That is, decode the mechanisms that make individual actions lead to social outcomes that are not foreseen or, or intended by any of the actors involved. Now, the puzzle of unintended effects is a very old one in the uh, uh, history of social thought. It was a sociologist, Robert Merton, who back in 1936 turned this into a topic for academic discussion as he wrote, chance consequences often result from the interplay of forces which are so complex that prediction of them is quite beyond our reach. And so while predicting the future is still quite beyond our reach, one thing that computational social science has allowed us to do much better is to map out that interplay of forces and circumstances that lead to unanticipated um, outcomes. And this, of course, matters because many of these unintended effects have important policy implications. So why does human action so often lead to consequences that are not intended or envisioned? Well, uh, once upon a time, the answer involved uh, metaphors of invisible hands, which is probably one of the most powerful metaphors since at least the Scottish Enlightenment, that dude up there is Adam Smith. Now we know that, of course, the answer has little to do with hands, invisible or not, and a lot to do with networks, that is, with communication structures that bind us together um, and allow us to trigger or encourage chain reactions even when we are not aware that we are participating in the chain. Now, if there is anyone in this room young enough in age or spirit to assume that when we talk about networks, we talk about social media, let me just remind us that the digital revolution is by no means the first revolution to shake the foundations of human communication. Uh, a prior technological revolution that turned communication networks into a fast um, global architecture um, was a telegraph, which back in the 19th century inspired many claims that sound strikingly similar to what many commentators claim today 
about the internet, especially when it comes to using metaphors. Uh, one prevalent metaphor is to compare communication networks to global nervous systems or global brains, uh, which is a metaphor that is used and abused uh, to talk about the internet of things, but that in fact was already, already being used two centuries ago to talk about the telegraph. And so this is the one thing that computational social science has changed in the last 20 to 10 years. It has provided us with a range of analytical tools that allow us to open the black box of metaphors and unpack how communication networks operate, how they are assembled, and more generally, how they mediate social life. And these developments have been encouraged to a great measure by the richer data that digital technologies have made available to us researchers. Now, let me just quickly open a bracket here to acknowledge something that no one has acknowledged so far, that, which is that the, this, analyzing this data also has a, a bunch of important ethical issues, uh, implications that we should take into account. I um, um, will not consider those issues because I only have five minutes, but not because I don't think they are not important. They are very important. And so what have we learned in the last 10 years? Uh, well, we have learned that networks are way more complicated as they emerge in the real world than when we thought about them as toy structures convenient um, uh, for our models uh, or thought experiments. And so trying to capture that complexity has led to the development of many methods and tools that help us see the reality of networks through uh, more sophisticated lenses. We have also learned that networks are like breathing organisms, and excuse the metaphor, they change constantly in ways that are not determined by the actions of any one individual involved, but that result from the concatenation of many individual actions. And so the fact that networks are not stationary objects becomes blatantly obvious when you analyze social media data that forces you to consider the temporal dynamics uh, of communication and then decide how to best encode uh, those dynamics in the networks that we analyze. And then we have learned that networks can be very counterintuitive in their operation. They are often themselves the unintended consequence of many individual decisions to activate ties. It is not only that networks emerge as a byproduct of individual decisions that are local and myopic, it is also that diffusion processes in those networks will also arise as the unintended effect of individual actions in ways that are difficult to anticipate. And this is the reason why, as Reza was saying this morning, we so often use simulation models so that we can analyze those counterintuitive effects uh, uh, in a systematic way. So one of the things that we have determined in the last 10 years is that most online networks are very hierarchical. There's a bunch of people uh, who are disproportionately central and therefore more visible in the exchange of information. But one, empirical, uh, one important um, uh, implication of the law of unintended consequences is that if we just look at aggregated patterns, we might reach the wrong conclusions about the mechanisms that brought those patterns into existence. So if we, if we analyze a network that is hierarchical, we might just assume that the inequality was there from the beginning when in fact that inequality might result from the cumulative effects uh, uh, that amplify random initial advantages. And c uh, computational social science has allowed us to understand better how this process of positive feedback unfolds. And in so doing, CSS research poses a question that is relevant uh, uh, for the policy implications that I was mentioning at the beginning of the talk, namely how do we regulate unintended effects when no one is really responsible for their emergence? And I'm going to leave you with a question hanging in the air. Uh, if you'd like to get more details, you're going to have to read my book, which is coming out in the fall, and I'm done. <laughs> actually work with this PowerPoint. <laughs> so, is that a quick switch? <coughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. So uh, I'm Duncan Templang. I'm the director of the Data Science Initiative. I kind of want to talk a little bit about that today for my own selfish purposes, but actually for you too, I hope. Um, I, I'm also a professor of statistics, um, which, and I, I also want to bring this note, note in because I want to see if this is a similarity. Um, I'm, I, I'm a professor of statistics. I've, that's what I've done for the last 20 years, and yet I've actually built, what I do for my research is build computing environments for the entire data pipeline. You'd think that that would be a very important part of statistics. It's not. There's only very few of us in the field of statistics, and I suspect that in, in, in computational social sciences, it's, it's a small field within social sciences, and that's what I'm finding. And that this is a very important problem if, we're, uh, if we don't actually develop more uh, computational sci uh, scientists, be they social scientists or computer scientists or whatever. So this, this is what happened to me, and I think it's, and I'm seeing it a lot with, with, uh, with students that I meet through the Data Science Initiative, which is. We're in this wonderful world where there's data, data, data everywhere. It's wonderful. We're in the fourth paradigm. We have now have four paradigms for research. This is terrific. 
and the students who want to use this are on their own to go and actually learn how to actually do it. Okay, and they come to us, which is great, we now actually have this uh, mechanism. But, um, but basically, they have to become, they have to learn all this themselves, and the good ones are going to become data-driven pioneers in their own field. I work with somebody who did this 25 years ago in English, and it's just wonderful. And so we really want to create those people, but as, as George was saying, and what, what, what we need to change the curricula to actually say this is an important part. Not, not having uh, faculty say, this is an important part, by the way, you're getting no credit for it, okay? Um, so we de definitely need to do this, and we, we can learn from my field, as I say, computing was has only just in the last five years become actually recognized as being an important component of, of research. This, this other point that I want to, want to make basically is, yes, there's a lot of data, and people have alluded this to this today, and we can talk about it in, in, in so much depth. A lot of it is what is called found data. It's extremely convenient, and in many cases, it's got so many biases. It's got so m it addresses the wrong questions, and it actually is allowing us to potentially focus on the wrong thing because it's nice, big, shiny data. Uh, it, and we do the technical stuff, but we're not necessarily asking the right questions. And so that's just a, that's just a, a basic problem. We know about the biases, but. Um, so I would love to see people actually figure out how to actually measure the right data. And we're in this world now where we can actually have very cheap uh, you know, uh, sensors and so forth. This should be part, I think, of, of, of social science, figuring out how do we actually measure the data that we actually want to measure. Co collaborating with engineers and, and, so, and so forth, that'd be great, but you can actually figure it out and do it yourselves. Um, there's also phenomenal opportunities within uh, that, that we should not be leaving to the technical to, uh, STEM fields for actually de dealing with data governance and ethics. Uh, these are just phenomenally important things that we are not good at. Um, and the other thing that I want to talk about, again, for my, my own uh, purposes for the Data Science Initiative, is that we have this initiative on campus, and, and it's just we're now in the position to actually get, get, get going uh, full, full tilt. Um, what we're really trying to do is evangelize and support data-driven research. I've talked to several people here and tried to and try, uh, about their research and how we can help. We want to become a hub for data science, and that means very, very broad, huge. We're not talking about big data, no, any data, <laughs> okay, any, any um, data science techniques. And what we really want to be able to do is, ta is to actually mix data science with the discipline to do qualitatively new things. We would love, as, as, as we would love ideally to have the disciplines be able to do this themselves, as Josh was mentioning that they would act, we would train people up, but that's a few years out. But we, there are really, pos uh, really great opportunities for doing qualitatively new things. What does the Data Science Initiative actually provide? Um, what services and expertise do we actually have to collaborate with? Okay, basically the entire data pipeline from data acquisition and fusion and merging to machine learning to high performance computing in various different ways to data visualization and also the process of reproducibility and data management and the and the pipe and actually the teamwork to go through the pipeline. These are the different elements of uh, that you can sort of see we kind of know how to do these this is a lot of my research and, and people I work with in the data science initiative what is the data science initiative physically it's a, we have a shared space ha, we have space on campus this is this is big <laughs> we're, in, we're 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 located in the library and what we really want to have is people coming in and sitting in that space to pr to create a multidisciplinary uh, environment um, and to that end sort of we have people we have consult we can drop drop in office hours we have workshops to try to train things that aren't being taught in classes we have these unseminars these these come with your problem and get and get that multidisciplinary perspective and most importantly what i'd like to point out is that we actually have a, we want to get people in. We have these, I see several of our, our, our graduate affiliates who come from different disciplines and come and sit in the space and talk to each other and, and, and learn interesting things. They go outside of their own domain. And likewise, we'd like to get faculty visitors in as well. And to address the, um, the teaching element, we are in the process, hopefully next year, we will actually have a graduate certificate and a designated emphasis to actually try to cross-pollinate these people from different disciplines. Thank you. Well, we were waiting. Um, I'm Xiaoling Shu from, uh, I'm a sociologist, but 20 years ago I started here with a master's degree in computer science with the specialty in artificial intelligence and knowledge discovery and the data mining. But uh, I hit that part of my training for 20 years, <laughs> partly because the data-driven research was um, uh, 
Scott uh, <laughs> was was very very important in the social science in the in the sociology. So uh, and so I have been doing uh, data driven uh, theory driven statistical modeling for uh, those uh, 20 years. So those are my uh, thoughts on. Um, how you, we incorporate uh, knowledge discovery and the data mining in uh, social sciences research. So, um, I, the fundamental question is about uh, causality. So, uh, when uh, we think about causality, almost all of the courses are multiple factors that are jointly necessary and sufficient. And this has two structures. One structure is the conjunctive uh, plurality of courses and the disjunctive plurality of courses. And the first occurs when various factors must be there jointly to produce an effect. And the second is often identified as the generating independent courses. And the effect is produced by each of several factors alone. Each of these factors are independent courses such that occurrence of two or more factors does not alter the effect. So this is the, uh, um, what we're facing. But on the other hand, and the social, uh, in social sciences research, we somehow prefer single uh, predictor or single cost models. And uh, we, uh, it's ironically labeled as cost, uh, because it's not a necessary uh, nor a sufficient condition, rather it's called uh, in this condition that is it's an insufficient but non-redundant part of an unnecessary but sufficient conditions. And if we go back, uh, we usually identify A as a cause, um, for example, or uh, B as a, a cause um, in a large number of uh, candidate uh, courses. So. Um, this is where uh, the data mining approach uh, is very different from traditional uh, uh, theory-driven and uh, statistical approach. Uh, one is uh, data mining approach uh, have automated the process of searching and evaluating joint and uh, heterogeneous courses. Uh, data mining can swiftly generate and estimate thousands of interactions and uh, combinations among predictors to improve the prediction of outcome variables. And data mining uh, can also provide many automatic or semi-automatic tools that aid researchers search for nonlinear relationship to increase model prediction accuracy. Data mining procedures can automatically generate breakpoints for continuous independent variables in order to capture a uh, nonlinear effect uh, between the dependent and independent uh, variables. And uh, um, data mining uh, also provides many uh, automatic or semi-automatic tools that aid researchers' search for nonlinear relationship uh, to increase model uh, prediction accuracy. Uh, data mining procedure can automatically generate breakpoints for continuous independent variables in order to capture a nonlinear. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, uh, so the. Uh, Data mining um, also uh, grew out of uh, the AI's preoccupation with applied predictive models. We mentioned that an important measure of success in this model uh, is their ability to accurately predict outcomes in real world application. Data mining uses a variety of approaches to make uh, predictions more accurate. So, um, So in uh, social sciences research, we usually focus on one or two theories uh, and uh, provide partial explanation. Thus, conventional statistical models emphasize a small number of uh, explanations of uh, simple functional form because these models are thought of as straightforward, uh, parsimonious, and elegant, and uh, theoretically appealing. So in um, data mining, uh, the data mining is interested in providing a full account of the event of outcome of interest. So this approach does not shy away from a rich analysis of multiple complicated and nuanced explanation as they all contribute to the strong explanatory power of the uh, resulting model. And uh, data mining also provides tools to process unstructured data and a variety of methods and the models to mine non-numerical data. These data are complicated with varying length 
uh, with a certain order with messy structure. Uh, Pre-processing uh, data uh, provides a vital role in pro uh, uh, converting data formats conducive to uh, data mining algorithm. So data mining also uh, faces uh, some challenges. One is uh, we was many of the speakers mentioned that before. That is, uh, uh, we usually are records of non-random uh, human uh, activities and our convenience sample. They are neither population census or well-designed uh, probability sample. Significance test is not. Uh, uh, suitable for this uh, type of convenience sample. And secondly, uh, some AI models uh, process the relationship between predictors and the uh, outcomes in a, a black box, particularly some neural network uh, models are in incredibly large and they have multiple layers. So the actual causal mechanism, including which uh, uh, predictors in which ways and by how much are usually invisible. So to make this AI models useful for social sciences research, it is important that we make uh, the causal processes in these models uh, perceivable and, and meaningful to the social scientist. Thank you. So from these presentations, we've one thing that's uh, stood out to me is that there is some tension between how we approach research. Uh, my background is in political science, and the archetypal research process is that you start with a research question generated from literature and debates or some empirical puzzle. You ha generate hypotheses, you find the optimal research design, and then you answer that question. Uh, it never worked that way, I think, in reality, even before this era of more data. But now that we have more data to work with, what is the best way to approach research so that we're honest uh, as researchers, um, but that also makes productive use of the types of resources that we have now access to? I'll start uh, with something out there. So in my talk, I discussed that um, I think there's a great deal of um, researcher degrees of freedom. So um, it is not inconceivable that people uh, trying to answer the same research question and with the exact same research data set, a big data set, but come up with different and intrinsically um, solid research designs, but then arrive at qualitatively different answers to the same question. So if that happens, that points um, to there's too much um, degrees of freedom for the researchers. So I think one way of um, you know, answering your question, just one approach, is to try to develop a standardized protocol for processing and analyzing big data. And, and currently, we do, not, we do not have that, right? For example, um, you get a very large Twitter data set looking at public opinion. Um, what do you do with it? You know, there are a million ways of aggregating that data, and that's something we all do. You know, how do you decide the size of your bucket? You know, there is no guideline. Well, in terms of um, survey research or more established um, experimental research or other approaches, there typically is a deadline, uh, a guideline. You know um, how to run a reliability analysis. You know, you know when um, to interpret this data to be valid or reliable and when it is not. But in uh, big data research, we don't have standardized protocols. So trying to develop that standardized research protocols for big data will be a uh, first step. I think uh, what we usually call uh, data-driven research is a wrong way to characterize uh, this research. And what uh, sociologists already do, they uh, uh, in, in a way that is, is a di didactic uh, process. We uh, sometimes probably the model of what we call the grounded theory uh, model. That is, you start, of course, with, w with very good knowledge about the field. You have some ideas of, uh, of the research direction. And then 
you use your data, but at the same time, let the data speak uh, for itself. Let data have some uh, say in the process. And then in the process of, uh, you, you, you also go through an inductive, that is you generalize from the pattern you observe from the data, and then you revise uh, some of the ideas you started with, and, uh, and you, uh, you go through iterations of uh, multiple iterations of that process so that the data has its dual status in this process rather than data is just uh, uh, secondary, it's not important, you, you, everything is dominated by theory. So that's what uh, I think uh, is uh, uh, this uh, new change or new era of, of, of uh, computing uh, social science. So at the risk of sounding trite, I mean, I think, I still think that the role of research is to answer questions that we don't know the answers to. And I think like the caricature of social science hypothesis testing is still like something to aspire to. I think that like, you know, criticizing my own work as much as anyone else is like, a lot of the last decade has been sort of, sort of proof of concept, like showing that data can be used to do something, but not necessarily answering like a fundamentally new question. And I think that like a lot of that has to do with just validation and making sure we understand what the data is. And I think I think it was Nash's slide, you had the, the guy searching under the, the lamppost and, and that sort of makes sense. Like you have to at least understand like what you can see. Um, but I think like it it is still a really young field. And I think like the really there are a handful of these studies already, but not a lot, and not the majority of them. And I think like maybe the next decade will be people saying, okay, like we, we sort of understand the measurement. A lot of the speakers in this session talked about issues of bias and representation and sampling error and so forth. And, and if we have a handle on that through some of these proof of concept studies, then I think like there are a lot of important longstanding social science questions that theories and hypotheses that just have been hard to test. And I think it'll be really exciting when we start to make progress on those. I don't, I don't think like we've really gotten that far in answering those sort of questions. I would just add, I totally agree with what you just said, but so if you think about where those hypotheses and theories we rely on come from, they often come from data sources that are very imperfect on their own. So I think the virtue of having access to new data sources, once we have validated that we can actually see something useful with those new data sources, uh, and that we understand the limitations, is to build a, like a virtuous feedback loop between you know, this new way of looking at the world and then revisiting these old theories and make them perhaps more granular in the co in conceptually or you know, to redirect our attention. Because it's not that the theories that we're working with are based on the perfect data sources either, right? So, so um, people talk about this fourth paradigm. It's, it's, it's an additional one. We, we, st we still use all four of them now. Okay, it's just an, it's an opportunity to actually have the, d the data generate hypotheses for us that we then go off and study using the correct methods. <laughs> so you're talking about uh, the importance of paying attention to data biases, but I wondered if you had anything to say about data heterogeneity as well. Um, so uh, uh, the speaker on the far right, uh, I believe you're Dr. Shen, right? Um, you were discussing how there's too many degrees of freedom and that there's uh, uh, data, big data protocols that have to be made. And in a way, it reminds me of uh, uh, some issues that I've been dealing with with my own research in so, uh, computational social science, uh, the issue of uh, what's called the Simpsons effect. And for those of you in the audience who are not aware, the Simpsons effect is saying that aggregating data can get you results that are different from the de-aggregated data. A uh, famous example is, um, uh, biases of admission rates among women in Stanford or something like that. No offense to Stanford, of course. Um, but it was, uh, it was where they showed, it aggregated, the aggregated data seemed to suggest that there was a uh, bias in which uh, departments were systematically uh, not choosing women to go into their, to their uh, field, while when you actually disaggregated the data by department, you actually saw there was a small but statistically significant bias for women in each field. And it's that women will happen to be choosing more difficult fields to begin with. So the, essentially the idea would be to ask um, uh, maybe instead of just looking at the biases in data, maybe the other question to ask is even in unbiased data, you might be looking at, you might be aggregating that unbiased data and creating conclusions which may differ significantly from, from the de-aggregated data. And I'm wondering if there's anything you, uh, you might want to say or want to say about that. Thank you. 
I'll take that. I completely agree with you. And I think the Simpsons effect is something um, uh, Dr. Winston Penn also mentioned in his talk in the first panel. Um, and this completely happens when people have um, same research questions, same data, but arrive at different conclusions. That's because they use a different size of the bucket. Uh, and that's why I'm actually calling for a standardized approach, standardized protocol for dealing with big data sets. Uh, for example, um, why I often review manuscripts and uh, what people often do is that, hey, um, it says in our methods we um, aggregated you know, our data sets in weekly or monthly chunks. And an immediate question I would typically ask is that, oh, have you tested other ways of aggregation? Does it produce the same results? So if we can make this standard um, practice, um, and it is something that reviews would require, or method sections would require, in all the manuscripts using big data that needs aggregation, then that would, to some extent, eliminate the problems you're talking about. Um, I'll add a little bit to that. Another, I think another layer to this problem is that in, in prior social science research, the unit of analysis was a very clear concrete unit. It was typically a person or an equally sized chunk of text data, whatever. In computational social science, especially with social media data, we often don't know anything yet about units of analysis. We treat them all the same as we used to do. A tweet as much as a post from a different platform, as much as sharing, as much as liking, we don't really know what weighting function these things should have or if that is a proper unit in and of itself and, and how much important or how much importance is it carries. So I think there's a lot of work needed on weighting and scaling these different contributions and gaining a better understanding of what a proper unit of analysis in computational social science with non-concrete data actually would be. Uh, to, to some some extent, this is just basic statistics. I mean, that, that's and you just and you ha you have to know your observational unit, and you and you don't aggregate. If you start with aggregated data, you're in serious trouble. Uh, and, and and this is part of the problem with with found data that it is aggregated, and we and we just make we just want it to be something else. <laughs> So this is this uh, session makes me think again about some of the issues that, as a, as as a young field, we might want to think about. I, I know Cindy, you talked about uh, you know there is no sort of pro standard protocol um, in response to Jennifer's question, and Jennifer's question I think had the assumption, um, and I think you were playing a devil's advocate to some extent, but it had the assumption that there is one right way to doing it, and that's probably not true. That there may be alternative approaches that are going to be there. So here's my. Um, question. How many, uh, how many of you are familiar with Cook and Campbell's experimental research protocols, etc.? Some of you have heard of this book? No? Then that's not a good question to be asked. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was, I was, the question was for the panel, but maybe I can open it up for the audience. Maybe I can open it up for the audience. A lot of us, when we took our research methods classes, we were exposed to uh, Cook and Campbell's book, and that sort of set the standards or norms of how one goes about uh, making claims of and you know recognizing threats to internal validity, external validity, as well as what are appropriate procedures that you would use to defend what you're doing. So, are we at a point where, given the different qualitatively different nature of of computational social science and the kinds of data we have, do we need a new Cook and Campbell or new sort of standards to decide? We know that significance testing is almost irrelevant because everything is going to be significant with the size of data that we have in many cases. <laughs> but effect sizes can become much more important in those cases. At least that's one argument. So I'm just curious, and I, and I guess I will have to open this up from the panel to the audience as well uh, to see. I mean, I, do we need a new Cook and Campbell book, a new sort of book that talks about be better practices, if not best practices, for computational social science? I think there's a bunch of books in the making. <laughs> but yeah, we probably do. But I would say that the, the book shouldn't be necessary. I, I think what has changed are not, the fundamentals of research haven't changed, right? Like good research is still good research. Like interesting questions are still interesting questions. And some methods require special training. And, and mostly uh, it requires uh, collaboration, right? Like, so I think computational social science requires a lot of uh, cross-disciplinary collaboration, and we are not use in the social sciences to working in teams necessarily. And so if I were to think about what would be the most useful book for me in terms of teaching students, it would be how to collaborate productively in teams where uh, you know, people attack research problems from very different angles. 
Um, and I think, yeah, that will ultimately be necessary. I don't think we need another book about what good research is about because that hasn't changed. Um, so that would be my answer to your question. Although I think there's a number of in initiatives that, that, that are trying to, you know, to, um, we need more practice in teaching this new generation of students and, and uh, uh, sort of giving them the language to, to talk to, you know, to people who are not trained in the same field. And we haven't learned all the lessons yet, so maybe it's a bit too early, but I think we'll get there, yeah. Um. I guess I'll be the like panel cynic. I, I, I would I would love to see such a book. I've 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 read some drafts of things that sort of aspire to that. Uh, it seems like, and so I haven't read Cook and Campbell, so I should go pick it up before I like go out walking on a plank. But it seems sort of audacious to think that one book could summarize like research methods, and and, and it also seems like you need a lot more than a book here, right? Like it seems like a, a graduate curriculum is is would could be designed around sort of asking questions in the space of like one domain of computational social science, but um, I don't know. I want to add to that, and this is something I um, think about all the time, is that um, this is an era of chaos, so to speak. You know, it kind of stabilized a little bit after um, the paper that was published in Science in 2009, but still I think this field is still very much in chaos. It could be a good thing because we see a lot of creative ideas emerging everywhere. So in that regard, it is good. On the other hand, um, it is chaotic and we see um, research ethics and um, standards for um, judging the quality of research is not very uniform, especially across disciplines. So that gives people a lot of confusion. How do you tell this is a good piece of research from a bad piece of computational social science research? So some kind of guidelines, I think, is helpful. Not necessarily in the form of a book like Cook and Campbell, you know, make it a canon or something like that. I think we're still maybe a few years, at least a few years away from that. But at the same time, some general guidelines of what is bad research, you know, and what is good research in various methods would definitely help the researchers as well as the consumers of this research. So we need some kind of guidelines to tell us how to tell the wheat from the shaft, so to speak. Can I quickly add something about the consumers here? I think, and this is again a topic that we haven't really discussed, and I only had one slide, and it was like three seconds, like ethics, right? Like, so I think computational social science, we have to do a huge amount of work in, in public engagement, because there's been a bunch of very controversial studies that were harshly judged, not so much because of the research, what the research was doing, but because of a lack of understanding of what the research was doing. And I think perhaps the one book that I would, that, that I would say we need urgently is a book that really a sort of tries to do some research on what, because often these controversial, controversial studies show us that the way in which we researchers perceive risk is not necessarily aligned with how the public, which are our subjects, involuntarily often, especially in studies that use cell phone uh, data and so forth, that our perception of risk and what puts subjects at risk doesn't correspond with the public understanding of risk. And this can undermine our, 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 our job, right? Like, so if the public stops trusting researchers and the value of the research, that will mean we won't get any funding. So that's, we, that's bad, right? And I don't think we're paying enough attention to ethical issues and how we're using this data. And I think we need guidelines about that that we don't have yet. Um, I don't, do you have any um, comments to give about that, like given the nature, yeah, so. Because you, your research, I'm, so, I'm sorry to put you in the spotlight, but your research is really about a very important soci societal problem, right? Like how can we decrease poverty, right? And so, but there's a trade-off with how much people are willing to be part of studies that they don't really understand versus the, the collective benefit, right? So. Sure, I can take a stab, although I think it, it generalizes to a lot of the work that people here and in the room are doing. I mean, I think one thing that's clear is that like university IRBs are totally not up to the task of understanding the ethical implications of this work. I think currently we're in like an equilibrium or non -equ an unstable equilibrium where it falls entirely on the PI to determine what constitutes ethical research. And so, you know, I can answer for myself. I, I won't like bore all of you with my answer to your question, but it, it involves sort of some combination of informed consent and then making sure that like the practices I use with the data are things that I would feel comfortable with. Um, but I think it's a totally, yeah, wild west right now of, of, of standard practices. I mean, there are people, there are like 
conferences like this specifically focused on like ethics and computational social science, but I don't think that they have like manifestos like that you want that would sort of provide real sort of guidelines to say a first year PhD student or something. I completely agree that ethical guidelines are all over the place depending on what community or what field or even what person you talk to, that, that should be something in a book. Another thing I would like to see in a new methods book is proper expectation management. We typically want everything we do to be innovative in our field, great. Um, but when you bring together people from vastly different fields, that might not be the case. Um, if you have a social scientist and a computer scientist, for example, and you want to create innovation square, innovation for both, that's a lot of innovation. What we often see is one of them doing service to the other, the human scientist helping with manual labeling of data, which is a terrible task to do, um, but a computer scientist need that, needs that for learning. On the other hand, the computer science people might um, help social science people or linguists or anthropologists to automate something or create a um, digital addition of something which is not challenging from a computational point of view but makes a big difference and maybe a lot of progress um, enabled in the social sciences. So, so one thing that I would want to see in a textbook is um, guidelines for upfront communication of what does every partner in this research project want to get out of that and what compromises can you make and not make in terms of innovating in your field or contributing to a totally different field which might not account as something new in your own area. If I may just leap in, uh, to all of these things are very, very important. Data governance, privacy, and all of these things need to actually be explained to people, so they do have to actually go in a book. Uh, but also, just things like you were talking about, the, um, the everything's significant. That's the trouble. Everything is significant, even the ones that aren't. Uh, so m multiple comparisons is a very simple thing that people don't use. Uh, so there's, there's, once you get into this large, high-dimensional data, you actually have to be trained differently to, to avoid the simple errors like Simpson's paradox and the multiple comparisons. <laughs> Very good points. I want to come back also to the point that, that uh, to transcend the discussion a little bit, the ethical, what, what Sandra was, was raising. And, uh, and, and invite already, make a plug for, the, for, the, for one of the panels in the afternoon, uh, which is the role of the public in the private sector uh, in all of that, which I think, I'm, I think like the general person on the street will not get scared about a study that an academic will be doing. Uh, but rather about what the government is doing, for example, with the digital big data footprint. I mean, the NSA is the biggest employee of, of, of PhDs in mathematics and, and computer scientists, and, and that's just, you know, so the government, in, in contrast to, to other periods, maybe, is actually leading. The government is leading in something, you know, uh, innovative, uh, extremely innovative in something. Same as the private sector, as we all know. I mean, it's not uncommon now that Facebook publishes in our highest journals without even revealing the data. Uh, and, and, and we just think like, oh, we are so grateful for that they do that. Thank you. So there's a lot of, lot of things going on there um, that also frames what we actually as academic researchers can do or allowed to do or should do. Uh, and I wanted maybe to, to and, and also in preparation of the, of, the, of the discussion we have in one of the groups in the afternoon, and hopefully all groups will touch on that question, what's the role of the public and the private sector in, in this revolution of understanding society? I would say that both are trying to define what collective benefit means in the, in the context of we're doing this research because we want to improve the experience of our users. That would be the private sector, right? And whereas in the, the public sector would be more about what? Because we, ha we have limited resources, we want to allocate them in the best possible way. We need data, evidence-based decision-making. Um, and, um, and to the extent that a lot of this data is in the hands of private corporations that do not necessarily, they are not necessarily interested in collective good, like sort of in the public good in general, but only about, that would be a challenge also. So I don't have the answer as to what role should they play, but I think access to data is becoming increasingly, who has access to data is becoming increasingly important and there's a political economy behind that, that we should be able to discuss openly and sort of try to renegotiate the terms maybe. Well, I guess one thing that we as academics have accepted for now, or not yet, but I think it is a fact, is that universities are not the big collectors of data sets anymore. That ship has sailed and it's probably sitting in Silicon Valley. Um, but there are still a lot of big unsolved problems, like even if we don't have, if we don't have that massive 
access to data. Uh, there are plenty of other things like regulations around it and whatnot um, that are completely unsolved issues yet and where we do have um, the opportunity to put a stake on the ground and become part of public discussions, poli policy discussions and so on and so forth on how to proceed with that. For example, the whole notion around um, ethics. Uh, how do you get in touch with people who actually make legislation around that? Um, how do you get your voice heard um, with people who make decisions about that um, that are in the making? So I guess that that's one of the opportunities we have and that we shouldn't let pass. 